Welcome everyone to this webinar. <laughs> uh, we are going to be talking with Jacob Rushfin about um, pricing globally. And I'm pretty excited to have this conversation. Uh, I've actually seen Jacob give a talk on this and read blog posts about this. And uh, he's got a ton of great stuff to share today and, and has a ton of other resources you can check out um, after the webinar. Um, but I think this is one of those topics that, that, that can immediately make some revenue, depending on your app, your volume, how popular you are in different regions. You might take a few things away today that make you, you know, 1% more, 5% more. In some cases, 10, 20% more money just by like flipping a switch. So uh, pretty excited to talk to Jacob today about these, you know, specific tactics to better understand pricing globally. Uh, with that, uh, Jacob, why don't you give us a, a short intro about yourself? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so I've been working in mobile marketing pretty much my whole career, um, you know, focusing really on, on retention monetization. And so that could be, you know, optimizing onboarding flows. It could be building out lifecycle marketing programs, um, you know, so was, um, you know, most recently at a company called Elevate Labs, working on the Balance Meditation app. Um, now I'm doing uh, uh, consulting and fractional advising work for uh, different apps. Uh, but what I'm uh, uh, kind of most passionate about right now is, is kind of creating content and sharing all my learnings in uh, uh, retention.blog. So go check it out uh, or listen to this talk first. And if you enjoyed anything or found anything interesting, then you can go check out uh, retention.blog for more. Awesome, thanks. Uh, you did break up a little bit there. I don't know if there's any uh, tabs you can close or if there's anything you can do on your end to, to make sure the the internet's uh, good on your end, but uh, uh, hope, hopefully okay. that doesn't cool. continue. All right, yeah, hopefully. Uh, yeah. Good. All right, a couple, th a couple more things as we get started. I'm David Barnard. I host the Sub Club podcast, do a ton of webinars like this, and I work for Revenue Cat. Revenue Cat's mission is to help developers make more money and we do that in a whole bunch of different ways you know we provide an sdk that goes in your app and a back end and you know a lot of you know about revenue cat at this point um uh, but we're actually building some really cool stuff uh, we just released a customer center that um helps you do win back and uh uh with all the things we're mentioning today around international pricing, we actually have a really cool price testing features uh, built in. Um, but as part of that mission to help developers make more money, we don't just build tools, but we host uh, webinars like this uh, that aren't selling revenue cap, but are actually helping you learn the tactics and skills and uh, get ideas to go testing your app. And so that's what this is all about. I also host the uh, Subclub podcast that's very similar. Um, not a pitch for Revenue Cat, but a podcast all about helping developers build, grow, and retain customers. Um, so if you haven't heard of that podcast, go check it out, subclub.com. Um, we're going to kick things off today with a poll. Um, so uh, look for the poll tab here. There should be in the bottom bar a little tab that says polls. And the question for today is, do you use Apple or Google suggested currency conversation rates, currency conversion rates for global pricing? Like, do you, do you just leave the default setting or have you customized? So it'll be really interesting to see with this audience, how much customization is going on. Like, are you here to optimize what you've already customized? Or are you here to just get started with uh, customizing your global pricing? So uh, if you would go ahead and answer that question. While you're answering a couple more things, we are gonna have a Q&A at the end. Um, we have so much to go through. I don't, I don't wanna uh, stop for questions in the, in the middle. We're gonna try and move quick because there's so much to cover. Um, so we'll do the Q&A at the very end and, and typically we'll, we'll run over a little bit. Uh, Jacob, I don't know if you have a few minutes after to, uh, should ask this before, <laughs> uh, but we'll often go over a little bit to make sure we can answer as many questions as we can. Uh, we get a ton of great questions. There's usually a lot of great chats. So, uh, feel free to chat during the event, but if you have a specific question for Jacob, uh, and or me, um, go ahead and put it in the questions tab. Um, 
and uh, we'll answer them in the order of upvoting at the end. So upvote the ones you find most interesting. Um, if we answer one of the questions, downvote it. Uh, so so that, uh, and I might just skip ones that we kind of clearly answered at the end. Uh, if you're following along on YouTube, Twitter, or LinkedIn, we do live stream these on other platforms. Um, if you do have a question, um, uh, try and find that live storm link because uh, that's where we will be hosting the Q and A. Um, and then the last thing is we will share a recording and post this to YouTube. So don't ignore the next. I, I should probably stop saying that at the at the start. I mean, everybody just asks. You know, we get this question all the time in the chat. Like, will this be posted? Will this be posted? But then you say it's going to be posted, and everybody's like, "Oh, I'll just check out and then catch it later, and then you don't know, catch it later." So if this is something like meaningful to you, that and I, I do think this can, as I said earlier, can have a, a meaningful impact on. Uh, a lot of app businesses, uh, pay attention today so you don't forget and uh, you know, don't get busy with email and think you're gonna catch up because you're not gonna catch up. <laughs> All right, let's check in on the poll before we get started. Um, I'm gonna answer myself because I have to answer to see. Um, and my answer, Jacob, is that <laughs> I just use default pricing, um, embarrassingly enough. So, Looking at the poll, it looks like it's actually a, a pretty good split. There's very few like me. Only 40% use the default store pricing. Uh, some people do a little bit of customization. And then a lot of people, 28%, uh, do like a lot of custom pricing. So that's, we got a good audience today, Jacob. This that's is, uh, I, I was expecting it to be a little more uh, heavily weighted toward myself, to, towards people like myself that just haven't uh, yet uh, dove into custom pricing. Um, so without further ado, let's kick off with the problem statement. Um, and, 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 and this is kind of an obvious challenge and, and Jacob, you actually wrote this, but I'll read it. Um, in-depth pricing research for international markets is hard and A-B testing isn't always possible due to user volume. And, and this is, I mean, a good reason why I haven't. And I, I think I, there's probably a third problem in here, and this is my problem, is that, that I get so few downloads internationally that it has not yet risen to the level that, that I think spending time on it would yield much. But may, maybe there's a chicken before the egg kind of thing as well, is that, you know, spending a couple of hours and just using your defaults could actually make a little more money, even if I don't go, you know, spend a ton of time on it. Um, but yeah, tell, tell me about the, the problem and what you've seen um, around this. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, pretty much like what, what you said there, it, it's, you know, I think we often, a lot of app developers um, start with one primary market, you know, oftentimes it's where they're based or, you know, maybe the US uh, is where they focus. Um, and, you know, when, when we're trying to figure out like, okay, well, we have this price that we know works. Oftentimes we, when we do AB testing, what we're really doing is AB testing just the price point in that market. Uh, and, and so, we're, we're confident in this price point in this currency in this country. Uh, uh, and, and so I think when we grow, we start seeing, oh, actually, hey, we're, we're starting to get some traffic or, or downloads in, you know, Western Europe, or we're starting to see some some traction in Canada. You know, I think a lot of, depending on what your, um, what language your app is in, that can often dictate where you, you start to get uh, um, other traffic. Um, India is, is often common where it's just a, such a massive country uh, and, and there's a lot of English speakers that can be a, a, a one where, where you start to see volume. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's like, it's really hard to figure out how to, how to, what's the right price point. It's, it's, um, it's hard to figure out for one other country. It's hard to figure out for, for a single country where you're the biggest and what the right price point is. It's even harder <laughs> to figure out where other countries where, where you're kind of not quite as big, um, you know, usually, you know, even when I've worked for big apps, you know, it, it'll, it could take months to actually get stat SIG, AB test results uh, um, for price test for, for smaller countries. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so it's, it's just a difficult problem. It's also like, 
I don't know how much time you've spent changing your your um, <laughs> country, country's price points and App Store Connect or Google Play. It's slightly easier in Google Play, but it's it's just hard. And so I think a lot of times it just comes down to like it's okay. Well, I have other problems, um, and all those reasons kind of combine into going. I'm going to work on something else right now. Uh, yeah. I think I think a lot of it comes down to that, and, and just not not being a, 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 as as focused upon as much. Yeah, the the iTunes. I mean, I have not, as I said, I have I have not personally localized pricing, but every time I uh, have changed a price or set a price in App Store Connect, that giant list of pricing, I will say, is is, is quite intimidating. <laughs> yeah. um, and then speaking of which, I mean, this is kind of the next uh, uh, a slide here is that Apple and Google do um, automatically adjust pricing across the entire globe, and so. Uh, it's not that individual countries don't get automated, automatic uh, price adjustments. All of them do. Both platforms do that. But the point is that they're not optimal, correct? Yeah. And so I actually didn't know this for a little bit, but when um, if you actually read what Apple and Google are suggesting, the price points they're suggesting are not like, hey, this matches... Um, local conversion rates, or, or this is optimal for your conversion based on your price point. This would see what we see other people are doing. The, the price points they recommend is so you get the same amount of revenue based on that initial price point. Um, and so uh, I think it's easily overlooked uh, um, because, well, one, you know, none of us read, just click next and go, okay, yeah, Apple's suggesting this. Okay, great. We make the assumption that these, these should, should be right, but you know, usually a lot of, uh, um, I'm based in the U.S., a lot of companies I've bought have been based in the U.S., U.S. is our largest market. And so when we take that U.S. price point and try to localize in other countries, um, you know, Western Europe is a, is a big one where the tax rates are so much higher. Uh, and so the price point actually isn't optimal because uh, Apple is adjusting the price point. So you make the same amount of revenue, take home revenue at the end of the day. But is that really what we want? Um, for subscription businesses, we probably actually want the, the higher number of subscribers, meaning the higher number of subscription starts or trial starts or whatever that may be, because over time we assume we're gonna retain X percent of users and more subscribers is usually the, the, the right thing to base off in the long run um, when, when kind of pricing decisions are, are close. Uh, and, and so it's, it's important to think about you know, okay, what is what is this actually recommending here? It's not the optimal price point for conversion. It's the optimal price point for getting the exact same amount of revenue, but that's only if you're converting at the same rate, if Apple is recommending a price point that uh, doesn't match kind of the, you know, purchasing power in the other country, well, your revenue isn't gonna be the same because people just aren't gonna to purchase or subscribe at the same rate. Yeah. And I, I, I get why Apple does this. I think there's a, there's a, I mean, th this is what you would typically do in a uh, physical goods situation um, where you have a certain margin that you need to maintain. And so in some ways I, I I was going to ask you, why do you think Apple did this? But then as I was thinking about it, it's like, I know why Apple did this. It's that, it's that if, if you have any kind of, marginal cost on a user, like my weather app, for example, like I pay um, and, and have been working on calculating the exact amount that I'm uh, spending per user per month on weather data. And, it, and it's actually quite high. Um, and so if you are in a situation where you have a marginal cost per user, um, if Apple tried to adjust the pricing to optimize for revenue or like price parity or some of these other things that we're going to talk about, if that was a default, it could it it it, it could get some folks in trouble who do have marginal costs per user. Um, but the reality is, and what you were kind of talking about is that most companies don't have that high marginal cost per user, where you can adjust the price and sell it for higher and lower, and not. Uh, not go underwater on on your your net margins, um, but let's go ahead and talk through the kind of the baseline. Like, 
what is what's like the most obvious thing to do and you've got three great examples here of like and th this is maybe like uh setting your price for beginners like wh what are yeah. these three and in what what times would you recommend it what times would you not and then we'll get into like the even more customized pricing yeah so i think um all of these and they're, they're essentially indexes right we we netflix we turn their price points into an index spotify turn their price points into an index and so um these are three kind of indexes you can use to uh um, to localize your price points you know we make the assumption that netflix big global company Spotify, big, big global company, they've spent, you know, millions of dollars on research. Well, let's just copy them. Um, and, and honestly, like it's not a terrible approach. I think that, um, Netflix, uh, Netflix used to, I think be like a, uh, kind of a standard that, that people just defaulted to for, for digital products, how to localize, um, uh, when when I was kind of assessing their data, I, I don't think it's the right one to go off of anymore because it gets really complicated really quickly because of kind of basically like TV and movie licensing in other countries. And so Netflix yeah. has shifted to more value based pricing where based on what's available in that country, they change the price points. And so figuring out like what content is available in each country on Netflix and then matching that to their price points is crazy hard. Um, Netflix, you know, does it internally somehow, but that's, that's probably not going to be possible for, for us. And so you'll, you'll be led astray if you, if you just kind of follow Netflix's, uh, uh pricing. Um, the Big Mac index is actually, uh, kind of a fun one. It, you know, it started years and years ago as a joke by the economist. And, and so it, it was, you know, just kind of piece they published and, and looking at uh, uh, how uh, the price of a Big Mac um, varied in, in, in countries around the world. And it actually, I think, has turned into a, a pretty useful tool. They've kept on on putting together. The reason I, I don't think it makes sense, um, again, not a bad starting point. I, I don't think it makes sense for digital products as much because going back to those fixed costs we were talking about, those just don't translate one to one. Like you, when you, when you, the, the beauty of building software is you don't have those fixed costs of physical goods, and so you have uh, uh, you know very low you know uh, um, you know per per user costs. Maybe David, you need to work on that for your app. Get those uh, uh, per user costs a little lower, um, but I, I'm, I'm sure there's you know some some fixed amount just for, for the data you're using. Yeah. Uh, um, well, and and then there's also the the kind of what you're saying about Netflix. It's like there's regional variation that that don't apply to the gen the the general uh, subscription app. Like in Argentina, it's probably much easier to get beef <laughs> into the McDonald's. And so the cost of beef can be much lower and they can probably price lower and, and still have the net margin they want to retain. But then maybe there's, uh, you know, an island country where the logistics of getting the ingredients there and they have to charge more, even though it might be expensive in that country because of those costs. Yeah, it, it's like, yeah, it's just such a different um pricing model that that just doesn't apply to to how we yeah. work yeah yeah exactly and so um so yeah not bad out of out of these three spotify is probably your best bet uh if you just want to use one company's prices and go this is good enough for us and, and as a starting point um generally the same music is available all around the world so it's not the same issue as netflix um i um I, I think that if you're a music streaming app, this probably is good for you. Um, one issue with Spotify is they really default towards monthly pricing. Um, and they, they push most people towards monthly pricing because they have amazing retention. Uh, for if you don't have a huge brand, um, you know, is monthly really optimal? You might, you might be more inclined to push annual harder. And so the price points might not exactly align. Um, so if, you, if you're gonna pick any one of these, Spotify is the best, but but generally, you know, they, they don't have quite the same dynamics as a, uh, and they're a much larger brand. And so I think there's better, better ways to kind of uh, um, 
find that that optimal price point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad we dove into this. Um because these are all the things you don't think about. Like I've heard about the Big Mac Index for a long time um, and, and Netflix. I mean, I think in the past I've recommended, oh, just do what Netflix does. Uh, and some of these intricacies are the kind of things that people don't think about until you um, talk through why those things don't actually work. So I, I, I think that was super helpful. Um, but let's move on to that starting price. Yeah. And um you posit that starting with the U.S. pricing is the, the best way to do it. Why, why do you say that? So really, it's start with whatever market you're the largest in and most confident in your price points. Um, for most apps, for a lot of apps, U.S. is your largest market. Uh, uh, you have the most data there. And so that's the important part. And so really, you want to you want to start with whatever price point you're most confident in. Uh, and because more people are purchasing there, you've maybe done A-B testing there. Um, you know, we, we see here from, from uh, you know, uh, uh, Revenue Cap's subscription report, North America generally is the, the largest market for, for most apps. Um, and so um, we'll go into this in a sec, but yeah, what, what I did was, um, and, and I'll say maybe I'm a little biased because I'm in the U.S. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll throw that out there, but I, I think I think still it, it's generally a good place to start. And so, um, what what I did, and we, we can look at in a sec, is um, starting with the U.S. price point, created my own index of a basket of subscription apps, um, and that uh, grow through in-app purchases. One other caveat for Spotify is that you know they don't have in-app purchases, right? It's all web purchases. And so the, the dynamics are a little bit different than, than people uh, uh, signing up for um, subscription apps via the app yeah. store or, or play store. Uh, um, and so alternatively versus using one company's index, I went and created my own index of top, there's about 10 top subscription apps. I have other iterations that can share later on that have many, many more apps, but, but I think generally this, this was a good start. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we get on to, to, to that pricing index, you, you mentioned something I, I thought was really good. Um, start with the, the prices you are most confident in. And so I'll pose this as a, as a question, though. How much price testing do you think um, a, a, an app should do? And how confident do you think folks should be about those prices before they start doing this localization? Or do you think they like go ahead and do some price localization, even if you're not super confident, but then just update it over time uh, as you get more confident in, in how you should price in that main market. I would, um, I would start with a few AB tests in your core market. Um, one, this is mainly because updating all your price points after is a real pain. And so it's <laughs> this way, just for you to keep track and manage everything. Right. Um, and so, um, but it's also like, well, if you're not confident in your main price point, what are you basing all these localizations off of? And so it's like, you know, bad data in, bad data out, I don't know, whatever, whatever that phrase is. Um, but uh, uh, so, so and, and I would start like, I think what often the best way to approach it is start with a few big AB tests. Um, so let's say like your 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 app is priced at like I don't know thirty nine ninety nine a year or something. Go with like seventy nine ninety nine or ninety nine dollars a year. Go big uh, initially, um, then you can kind of work your way in uh with all a b testing um when, when you're when you don't have millions and millions of users uh you, you want to test you want to test variants with a large uh a large difference and that's the best way to actually get a confident result um when you're testing small optimizations especially when you have lower scale there's just it's just very high risk to get inconclusive results um, if you want to like validate this, run an AA test. Um, so an AA test is when you're testing each variant is exactly the same. 
And when you have low sample sizes or low data, you can see five, 10% variation uh, um, yeah. with, between those two variants. And so all your past assumptions may be incorrect. So you say, oh, wow, we got a 9% lift here. Well, we also got a 9% lift when we were testing the same thing, you know, <laughs> versus itself. And so it's like, what? Well, so, um, you yeah. know, A-B testing and, and, and stats sig are tricky. Uh, uh, and so you stand the, the largest chance of success with big, big variations, big differences between your two variants. So you can get conclusive results. The um, getting, having a failed test is much better than having an inconclusive test. With right. a failed test, you learn something. With an inconclusive test, it was just a waste of time. Uh, and so aim for big differences and then, you know, do maybe like two, three of those. If you're, if you're still smaller, um, you'll hone in on a price point that generally was better than where you started. Maybe not like perfectly optimal, but like still pretty good. Uh, um, you know, if we think about like how many real price points do subscription apps have nowadays, what it's like. Twenty nine ninety nine, thirty nine ninety nine, forty nine ninety nine, up to like eighty nine ninety nine, maybe ninety nine. So it's what like six. Uh, um, and so just you know, test a few of those, hone in on something that works well, and with with a, like two to three tests, you can probably get get to a good uh, uh, a good annual uh, price that that will work well. Yeah. I'll, I'll add one thing to that, that uh, I, I like the way you frame that. And actually the AA test, I had never heard of that before. So surprisingly enough, I mean, I'm not a, a statistics guy um, and, and haven't done a ton of AB testing myself, uh, but AA test, that, that's, uh, that's great. But, but one thing I'll add to your inconclusive uh, test uh, results is, is that one thing you can learn from a, a quote, an inconclusive test is whether or not it, so so the way statistical significance work and you could probably explain this better than me but but if you have a sample size of like a thousand people um and that's fairly low but you can get to statistical significance if the difference is higher so if you had a 20 percent increase in subscriptions um, you could get to statistical significance at a lower sample size. And so one thing on an inconclusive test that you can at least learn from is go ahead and back calculate how big of a swing, and you, you really should be doing, I mean, if you're really setting up your test, right, and this is what they do, like when they're doing uh, placebo-controlled trials and things like that, is that you, you calculate the sample size you need to determine the difference that you're hoping to see, but you can back calculate that. So once you've run an A-B test, go ahead and look at like, you know, if with that same sample size, we had seen a 20% increase, it would have been statistically significant. And then at least you can learn, even though it was inconclusive, that it was unlikely that that price change would have led to that large of a change. And so then you can say, well, if it's not a 10% increase or a 20% increase, maybe it doesn't matter as much. So I, I think there are things you can learn from inconclusive tests, but it, it's a lot less. <laughs> yeah. You can at least like learn what the exact number, you know, the plus or minus would have been to, to create statistical significance. Yeah. And, and one other piece on that inclusive test, you know, you can track those cohorts that were in those variants, you know, over months or weeks and see in three months, did that LTV data change? Because sometimes actually the cohort in three months may be different, it may be conclusive, it may be that one uh, uh, one group actually had a much higher retention rate or, or one group had a much you know higher churn rate. And, and so uh, um, don't just look at the results and be one and done. Keep on running tests, don't wait three months to run another test, but go back and check those old cohorts uh, uh, to see what happened and see if anything changed. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. Uh, we're going to move much quicker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you and I have a lot of thoughts, but uh, to get through the rest of the slides, I, I'll, I'll shut up and let you talk more. Uh, but I, I don't know, these, these things, I, I mean, I could literally, we could do this for like four hours and, and I would still have more questions and ideas and thoughts and stuff, but uh, I'll, I'll, we'll move a little more quickly. So let, let's move on to um, your kind of initial um, price testing, um, like what your thoughts are on kind of the, the starting point. So. Um, talk us through this this slide yeah. and kind of these basic um, rules around uh, adjusting your pricing. So, um, so yeah, when I was trying to figure out like for, for these other countries, I said, okay, well, you know, I, I looked at Netflix, looked at Spotify. I was like, I don't think these are exactly right for for my use case. And so I um, created a I think about about ten other apps uh, and looked at their. Um, their price points in other countries and basically said, I think these apps have decent size volume in these other markets. I think um, not every single one will be perfectly optimized, but averaging these 10 apps price points across these countries together, I think I will get a good starting point uh, um, for localizing price points. Um, and so I looked at, um, I think four or five countries in the Eurozone, um, generally people price all the countries in the, the, the bigger countries in the Eurozone the same um, and looked at these other countries along with a few others. But generally these countries are uh, um, some of the largest uh, um, that, that you might want to grow in. Uh, and so starting with our US price point, I suggest that um, you price uh, uh, Eurozone and UK about 80 to 90% of your US price. Uh, and Canada was about one to one with your US price. Um, and so this is after the conversion rate. And so if you think about it, um, for example, for Canada, uh, it's not that your the, the exact number should be the same. So if you have 59.99 annual plan in the US, it shouldn't be 59.99 Canadian it should be, I think, you know, it's probably like 79.99 Canadian. And so these one-to-ones are after the conversion rate. And so basically processes uh, applying the conversion rate and then applying this discount uh, um, to that localized price point. Uh, and so, you know, some of this comes down to purchasing power. Some of this comes down to uh, um, the value your app has in those other countries. Uh, and so, Generally, I found these are, are um, uh, make sense as a good starting point. If you don't have other data, haven't done other price testing here, you can use these to kind of kickstart your localization versus trying to have to come up everything from scratch uh, uh, for yeah. yourself. And then I really like this next slide, and I'm going to go ahead and kind of yeah. um, read it. through this to because uh, what we probably should have done was combine these two into one. Um, if you just want to go but... to the next slide. Um, oh, is that what you do? Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so UK, 26% higher than USD. And it, so this is what Apple suggests. I actually saw this recently. I've had, I have had quite a few purchases in the UK and my price in the US is 40 and I'm getting like 51 something. I was like, wow, their UK is paying me a lot of money there. So Apple is pricing higher in the UK and you're suggesting about 10% lower. Eurozone, 9% higher. You're suggesting 15% lower. Uh, Canada, about the same. Uh, Australia, 30% lower is what you're suggesting, or sorry, what Apple does. And you're suggesting only 10 to 15% lower. So there's cases where you're, you're suggesting that you would probably raise the price a little bit versus lowering the price. Is, is Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so um, the, um, yeah, again, like, you know, Apple is just applying uh, um, kind of take home proceeds based on research what other apps are pricing. Uh, um, this is kind of what I found, you know, is, is a generally a good starting point for your localizations. And so, yeah, some, um, you know, you, you may be raising the price, some of you may be lowering the price uh, and, and we can get into more on kind of how, how you should approach that process. Um, yeah. You know, you shouldn't just, these are good starting points, but I, I don't recommend just applying these blindly uh, right. and just kind of auto applying um, unless you're like still very small and don't really have much volume in these other markets because 
price changes can affect how much money you're making. And, yeah. and so um, you don't want to dive into these blindly, but yeah, it, exactly where um, it, it can be, it can be a little bit scary to um, um, lower prices. Uh, uh, and so we want to approach that cautiously, but you, and, and again, like Apple is suggesting this is gets you this exact same take home proceeds based on taxes and fees in those other countries. And so my price points, my recommendations are optimized more towards conversion, uh, um, based on, on kind of the, the index I created. Yeah. And then in some of these bigger markets, I mean, the swing is huge. So like, instead of in India it being just 21% lower, you're suggesting up to 80% lower would just even be the starting point. Um, one, of, one of the interesting caveats here, and I'm curious to get your take on this, is that, you know, in countries like India, it's such a large country, and there is actually a more affluent kind of middle class and upper middle class in India. What, what are your thoughts on kind of like understanding who your market is in those countries and and is that kind of one of the ways you would suggest potentially customizing like if your app is really big in india but it's big in that more kind of uh more affluent um uh population would you suggest maybe uh, adjusting it not not adjusting it quite so low yes yeah, so um there are one, I think you want to look at um, how many free, what your conversion rates are, how many free users are coming in. Uh, um, so if your if your conversion rate in India is five times lower than in Canada or in Australia or or in you know the U.S., okay, well there's some mismatch, right? There's some mismatch to value uh, uh, that that or expectations to value there. Um, I think, and, and so that's a, that can be an easy signal that okay. Uh, uh, if your conversion rates are the same, well, may maybe you're okay, right? Uh, um, if your best, if it's the same as your best converting market, it's unlikely you're going <laughs> to get a higher conversion rate or, or meaningfully higher conversion rate by, by lowering prices. Um, I think it also depends on your product, right? Who is it aimed at? Um, you know, it, is it aimed at a, at a more affluent uh, uh, um, kind of demographic or is it, you know, generally, you know, the, the uh, um, you know, for everybody. Uh, and so that can help inform you. I think also, um, you know, maybe you want to price as a premium product and price above the market. That's a conscious decision you can make. Uh, and there's also, um, you should, which I, which I get into in future slides is you should, um, you know, this, this, these price points are based on a basket of kind of 10, you know, large app, large subscription apps that are doing well. A more relevant index is actually finding direct competitors in your industry right. uh, and trying to pull in local competitors. Um, I think local competitors probably have the, the, the best kind of pulse on the market. And so understanding how they're price pointing, how they're, how they're, they're pricing their products, because they might actually be your most direct uh, uh, and relevant competition uh, that, and you might even know about them because you're just focusing on these big global players and you think that's who you're really competing with. But really, uh, these local players might actually be the ones once people are actually deciding, do I use your product or do, you, do I use this this local local company that uh, actually may cater to my needs better and have a, a, a price that that fits my uh, um, you know ability to pay better. Yeah. And then I'll add one more to that as well is that uh, understand your source of traffic in those individual countries. So like if if you've been spending a ton on, you know, meta ads and they're finding you the exact right person and your conversion rates in the U.S. are incredible, but you're in, in India, um, it's, you know, more organic or you're maybe buying ads, just display ads because they're so cheap. It's like understanding the the source of traffic should also kind of be be put into that equation. Um, all right, next, uh, slide. And, and you kind of already covered this, that these are just kind of broad suggestions. Um, and of course, you know, take that category specific approach. Um, so you already covered this, but why don't you just step us through this yeah. quickly, uh, um, kind of your thought process of stepping through customizing pricing. Yeah. So, um, I would, yeah. 
pretty much like I was saying is, is um, there's going to be more relevant price points for you, for your product, for your industry. Um, and you really want to know those. You should know like who are, who are your biggest global competitors. You should know their price points in other markets um, because they're, they're probably done more testing than you. They're probably better, uh, yeah. uh, better optimized. And if you have a similar product focused on a similar audience, um, that's probably easiest just to kind of copy what, what they've done, uh, and start from there. Um, I think that, you know, most people have probably like 10 markets that, that are drive, you know, 90% of the revenue. Um, there may be a log tail. So, so probably like 10 is good to start. And, I, and so there's no, um, and so you actually, actually go to the, the next, uh, um, yeah. So let's say, uh, um, yeah. So if I had a meditation app, like calm and headspace are the obvious ones, right? They're big global players. This probably provides me with, with pretty solid information for, for how to start. We, we pick our markets, uh, and then, um, record our prices. So this, um, this, this part is actually pretty annoying, uh, and, <laughs> and, and actually like, yeah, pretty painful. So there is no, there are approximations, how to get people's price points. You can, there's apps that you can localize the app store. Uh, um, I forget what it's called. I don't know if you know, there's one big one, David, where you can, um, basically change. I think it's like a little mini VPN for your phone. It basically has like, a um, you can look at the app store in different countries and like, look at different app listing in different countries. Um, someone in the, in the chat knows it, feel free to share. Um, um, but. And because so you, you have to list your price points in your, in your, um, your app store listing. Right. But, um, you don't actually, those don't have to be your super current one. They don't have to show you it's all your possible one. So th there's the only real way to know actually what price points your competitors are using right now in other countries is to go into the app store, change your app store country, and then go open that app after you've changed your country on your phone. Um, wow. I'm less familiar with Android, the Android process here. So again, if somebody has uh, uh, the process here, uh, I should have said this earlier, these price suggestions were, were only done for iOS apps, uh, um, but, but generally like the purchasing power, generally it'll be a similar uh, 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 range here. Um, yeah. And, and so, then you also don't know for sure if you're in an A-B test or not. <laughs> right, right. So what I actually do for apps that I, that I uh, pay attention to closely, it's like, I'm, um, I'm probably doing it like every few months, like rechecking prices. Right. Uh, uh, and this is not for like all apps, but like there's probably two to three that you're most closely competing with that you really want to know or, or the biggest players. And, and that's, you know, that's huge competitive intelligence because if you see that they've had one price point for half a year and then all of a sudden it changes uh, and it sticks with that, well, what, are they, what does that tell you? Well, they did a test and that won. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, you might not have the data to do that same test. That's hugely valuable for you. Uh, and so you can try that yourself and see if that affects conversion or not. Um, and, and actually changing your price, changing the price point for one, uh, uh, country in the app store is super easy for, for one subscription that is, but, uh, and, and so you don't actually have to deploy any code changes. You don't have to deploy any tests. And so for a single country, if you want to see if a, a price point changes, you can just go into the app store and change that price for that country for that subscription and see it's, it's not a true AB test. The seasonality could affect it, but you can kind of do a pre post analysis and see, uh, uh see what happened. Uh, and so that can be a great way, uh, uh to kind of change these, these prices quickly. Um, but yeah, so, so really, um, it's annoying, but this is, this is the best way, you know, get your intern to do it. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, start, start creating basically your own index. And, yeah. and this is, this is what I do for, uh, um, app. So yeah, if you go to the next slide, um, we can also do this for web subscriptions and, uh, this is hugely valuable as well. It's much easier because you can just get, get a free trial of some VPN, 
uh, and then you can just change this, the, your country and your browser uh, and uh, kind of check their price. This is, you should not, this is not a substitute though for actually going yeah. to the app store because web subscription prices, um, if, the, if the competitor you're checking is savvy, they will be different and they should be different. Um, you know, there's different take home revenue uh, uh, percentages when you're making web subscriptions, there's different conversion rates on web. And so you can infer a lot of different interesting things based on the, 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 the delta between app store pricing and web subscription pricing. If the web subscription price is lower, you can probably infer that um, the conversion, their conversion rate on web isn't as good or maybe their acquisition costs are higher or lower. And, and so this can be really interesting to see the difference in those, those price points. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is a quick example of what that looks like. So, you know, th this doesn't take into account the, the conversion rates, but just basically pull the price points in all the countries. I think this is looking at Calm's uh, um, annual plan. And you can basically, what my process is, is just divide the, um, uh, the U.S. price by the U.K. price and, and you uh, um, get, a, get a multiplier. And so we can see for um, India, I just take that uh, U.S. price point and multiply it by 57 and can up, then upload that price. Uh, at, at your first attempt, you probably want to actually convert to the, um, uh, uh, the local price to see those conversion differences for, for just blindly multiplying. But, it, but you know, Doing this ongoing basis, it's one extra step that 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 can can be tedious. So this is just you know my process here for okay, how do we actually do this in, in, in reality um, after we find those uh, all the local prices? Cool. We we've still got a lot of slides to go through and not much time to do it. So uh, let's do a let's do a lightning round. Let's see if cool. you can. Uh, I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna switch this slide. You give me sixty seconds. I'll switch to the next slide and we'll just uh, crank yeah, through yeah. this quickly and we'll get to the Q and A. Uh, and and again, I'll hold my feedback this time. So cool. uh, where do you get started? Yeah. So we talked a little bit about this, but the easiest place is hey, country's not converting as well. Well, let's start there. There's low risk, right? Uh, that's how you sell that. Uh, if uh, uh, if you want a lower price, that's scary, right? Okay, well, the country's already not converting well. There's pretty much no risk. Let's let's try there, and then use that price to inform future price tests and, and kind of understand uh, um, how this affects uh, conversion rates. See, it's like I almost know what slide's coming next. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so so in the next slide, um, we can, you know, basically like. The, the countries that have lower volume, um, but huge markets is, is where there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, and so you can go, hey, we have so many free users coming in from India, but no one's converting. Um, that That's probably the biggest opportunity for most people, India actually, because if you have an English app, English speaking country, but low purchasing power, you're pricing too high, that's where I'd start. Um, so th this is really interesting. Uh, uh, I think that there's other options, but besides localizing pricing. Um, and so you can actually change the products you're offering. Um, this is Impulse. Uh, and, and so you can see, this is the US, they have multiple, they have a weekly, they have an annual and lifetime price. I think this was, is uh, uh, Brazil. You can see they're only offering a weekly price and a lifetime price. If a country has lower purchasing power, sometimes just having that annual, that big annual purchase, one-time purchase is too much for them. Um, maybe they feel more comfortable with smaller purchases and your weekly, your weekly subscription can actually function as a trial, right? Uh, and so it can be, it, you can think of it as kind of a one-off purchase. Um, you know, hey, I, if someone, uh, um, you know, comparatively to some price points, like you could think of it as an in-app purchase, they have access for a short amount of time, but there's actually much more upside for you if they continue to use the app longer that one week. Uh, but this isn't right for everybody. Don't uh, uh, don't use weekly subscriptions if, uh, um, uh, and so on the next slide, um, Revenue Cat has a bunch of data on, on where weekly, what, what categories use weekly subscriptions. Um, but yeah, here, here, here we go. That is much easier to see. If you think about these, they, uh, uh, these categories, they all have these one-off use cases. 
your business app, I just fax something the other day. I don't have a fax machine, but I need to fax something. There's apps to do that. Social and lifestyle this is pretty much dating. Um, get those booths for one week, get all your matches, go on some dates, utilities. Um, it, what's really wild is all, like three or four of the top five apps and utilities are all phone cleaners, phone cleaner apps, like scrub data or like optimize your storage or something. Um, I don't know if, if you're looking for a new app idea, app idea, maybe build a phone cleaner, uh, um, but, and then photo and video, you know, edit, edit a video, uh, quickly and, and, um, yeah, you can go to the next slide and, and flightly is a, um, this app is flightly. So you don't actually have to offer, um, all the same functionality, uh, on both subscriptions. If you see here on the annual plan, um, have unlimited flights and features. And you compare, if you look at the little uh, subtext on the bottom, the weekly plan excludes calendar sync, trip it sync, and email import. For people with a one-off use case, you're going on a few flights in a week, you don't need all that stuff. Uh, and so this can be what features are available on what subscriptions can actually be helpful to nudge people to the more valuable plans for you. And so I think this is a really underused tactic in terms of offering different functionality on different subscription plans to help optimize your subscription mix. Uh, and so I think this is a, this is a cool tactic to, to think about as well. Um, all right. And, and so, you know, I, I published uh, this post on weekly subscriptions. You all sent me uh, um, kind of this, this data. Long story short, there's a little difference by region, but not much. Uh, um, so so if, if you're curious there, uh, and, um, so lastly, um, you can go to the next slide. If, if you're, uh, launching a new product and don't know where to start because you don't have any data, try the Van Westendorp price sensitivity, uh, um, analysis or, or survey, basically, um, go Google it after this, if you're interested, but it's four questions. Uh, and that if you go to the next slide, it kind of forms this, uh, um, uh, where these points intersect tells you, gives you a, a range of where your price point should be. Um, this is a little teaser. Go, go check it out for, for a month. It's super easy survey to run. And as always, uh, um, analyze, test, and iterate. These are starting points, but this is never going to be the final, final product. So, so keep going from there. Don't stop here. Awesome. That was a great speed round. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was the most uh, kind of density of value per time of the of the whole webinar. Right, right. Um, I love it. All right. We do have uh, a few minutes for questions. And as I said, I don't, I don't mind going over. It sounds like Jacob has a little extra time as yeah. well. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump into the questions. Um, pull that up. So... Sorry, I'm getting my uh, screen dialed in to answer these questions and sort by upvotes. All right, the most upvoted question. After you conclude your A-B test, what do you think about all your, what do you do about all your failed SKUs? Do you leave them and maintain those subscribers in their current subscription or do you retire the S SKU and try to migrate those subscribers over? Uh, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts? You leave them. Um, yeah. it's, it's, I think that's what most everybody does. Um, it's, you know, they're still paying you. Um, there's much more risk with trying to move them over to creating higher churn. Um, you know, after years, if you see that there's tons of users on a less than optimal plan, like a monthly plan that churns at a higher rate, um, maybe you can try to offer some incentives to switch over to annual, but like just it, there's a real risk and just, just higher churn and, and people leaving, uh, do that. So yeah. it, simply just, just leave them. <laughs> I, I'm personally hoping that Apple and Google help solve this. And I, I think they will eventually, like they, they know this is a problem and they, it, it, it's funny because for a long time, Apple specifically almost discouraged uh, price testing. It was like, Ooh, gross. Like, you know, creating extra SKUs, like don't do that. And, and I mean, I even remember, 
um, hearing about rejections and like Apple would be like, why do you have six prices in there? Or like uh, App Review would reject you because you had a $100 price and a $50 price, but your paywall only showed a $50 price. And they're like, how do we get to the $100 price? And you're like, yeah. well, we're doing an A-B test. <laughs> you get on the B. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it seems like maybe four or five years, they've been like, embracing this more and more and then the speed at which these platforms move you know as they've embraced this more and more i think there's probably been some momentum internally to start solving this and making it easier for developers to do this so i am so freaking hopeful <laughs> that in the next you know hopefully not three years but in the next you know 12 to 24 months uh, we'll get some better SKU management tools from the platforms because it, it really is just a mess. So uh, I, I very much um, uh, sympathize with this question, Allison, because it is a pain. I mean, go go look at any big app and, and the, the uh, well, okay, here's, here's one tip because, and you will see this, is that um, a, a lot of apps now are using subscription groups to where once they've found the price they really want, they do leave all those other SKUs, but they create a clean subscription group and they only put the like two or three uh, uh, products that they're gonna be offering over the long haul. So if, if, if you're in a but phase- that's for new subscribers. But that's, yeah, right, exactly. That's only for new subscribers. But then at least when people go to cancel their subscription and Apple's actually been even changing this UI uh, to, to where you're not seeing like 20 other prices and stuff. Um, but that is, you know, most big subscription apps, when you go to the app store, you're going to see like 15, 20 different prices <laughs> and all these abandoned skis and stuff like that. So it, everybody has to deal with this and there's not really a great answer, unfortunately. Uh, it just is what it is until they solve this for us. All right. Uh, next question. Is there a specific pricing strategy to have between monthly and annual subscriptions? Kind of off topic a little bit, but I, I think it yeah. maybe Wait. it is good. And you kind of mentioned it a little bit about some countries maybe don't even show the annual price. Yeah. So quick guidance. Um, your The monthly value of your annual plan should be 50% less so you can offer the discount on annual. Does that make sense? So let's say your uh, your um, monthly plan is $10 per month. The annual plan should be $5 per month, you know. Uh, Equivalent. Uh, 60, yeah, bucks. So 60 yeah, bucks. Yeah, When, when I, I pulled the top price points for, or the price points for the top like 25 apps in a bunch of categories, the, the basically all of them follow the strategy. So uh, um, that it's, it's kind of good, set it and forget it. Uh, uh, yeah. where, where because you, the annual plan is more valuable. Usually um, I think in um, what Tammy Taw's presentation at uh, um, conference, you know, Google had, she, she had some data that like discounting your annual plan by 50% will generate 50% more revenue over a two year, uh, like two year LTV. Uh, uh, and so, you know, pretty, pretty strong data there. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll reiterate, um, kind of your, your advice for pricing generally is that that's the, that's the starting point set and forget, like that's where you want to start with your, uh, split between, uh, annual and, uh, monthly, uh, but for, for some price points and for some apps, uh, especially apps with higher retention where uh, people would prefer to pay monthly. And a good example of that, funny enough, I'm wearing the shirt, is uh, Ladder charges $30 a month or I think it's $130 a year now. And even for more affluent countries like the U.S., $130 in a one-off, you know, is, is, a, is a big line item budget for a lot of folks. And right. so... Um, you know, but that but that's a good example. I mean, thirty thirty dollars a month is three hundred sixty dollars a year. So they're actually, I think, lower like than that fifty percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it point point being, you know, uh, that's a good starting point. But then, yeah, you know, another thing you should test and um, and and then to your point earlier as well, Jacob, is that these are these are the things you really want to look at over the long haul. Is that when you increase that price. 
does that monthly retention drop off substantially? This is something we don't do at Revenue Cat that I, I really think we should have a chart for is um, subscription um, movement. So uh, how many people are are starting with that lower price point, but then once they're convinced, and Ladder is a good example of this, like my wife uh, and daughter were subscribers, my daughter's no longer a subscriber. My wife is like, I'm gonna use this forever. This is like my app that I'm gonna work out with forever. Um, and I really should switch to the annual plan for her. Cause like, you know, we'd save so much money. Um, but these are the things you should be tracking over time to understand like, okay, we bumped our monthly price to 10, but we saw like dramatic churn, but is that churn or is that people moving to the annual plan? And then if at $5, you actually had really good monthly retention, then maybe that is still a good option. And one AB test I did was, um, uh, four dollars a month versus forty dollars a year in my app, and I saw actually. And what I did is I only showed the four dollar a month plan, like, and then you had to hit the all plans button. And I was shocked to see a twenty percent increase in conversion by people just seeing that lower price uh, and not seeing any other price. And very few people who saw that four dollars a month plan actually hit all plans and switched to the annual plan, but. And the test was against seeing just the annual plan. So by seeing $4 instead of $40, 20% more people became subscribers. In my app, because I followed the data, I did see enough churn that it's not going to net out to be a higher LTV. So I switched. But then what I did was I'm now using the whole thing. And we saw this on, on the flighty um, um, paywall is that I'm highlighting um, that it's three dollars and 33 cents a month so the first thing they see is 333 a month billed as 40 dollars annually annual. so that i have not done an a b test yet showing that <clears throat> against the only showing the four dollars a month uh but these are all the things that like you know tons of testing that can be done to kind of find your your own um optimal pricing between the two and then make sure you're, you're you know looking at those cohorts over time to make sure that the initial results don't fool you because at first i was very fooled by that 20 percent increase in subscribers uh, but then they just started turning like crazy and you know realized pretty quickly that the showing the 40 dollar price was still optimal um, and i've since also done what jacob suggested and raised my monthly price to five dollars a month um, but again, haven't done that AB test yet as well. So, uh, there's so much to do. I know it can feel overwhelming at times, uh, just how many optimizations and tests that, that you can and should run. Uh, but you know, this, this is a game, right? It's, uh, you build, you build something people find valuable and then, you know, you figure out that kind of optimal spread to, to make the most people happy. And then one last thing, I mean, I don't know, I, I, there's still a, a little bit to, um, pricing if your if your ultimate goal is maximizing every penny then understand that if you if you have a mission driven company if you're hoping to you know build out uh, a larger user base if the users are bringing value to the app by contributing data or whatever like all trails is a good example it's one of the cheaper subscriptions in the industry and part of the reason they do that and part of the reason they have such a generous freemium tier is that the freemium users and even those like that low price those people are contributing data and using it more frequently and those cheaper prices often retain better so it's like it's it's uh it literally is calculus to to figure out all these things um and and um make sure you you clearly understand your goal both short term and long term uh as you're making these decisions and then you're tracking those cohorts over the long haul yep yep exactly exactly <clears throat> All right, next question. Um, I work with a global brand concerned about A-B testing pricing due to potential backlash if different regions are discovered varying discounts. Are there alternative ways to optimize pricing without risking negative PR? This is a fantastic question. Yeah, um, well, one, like ask them, figure out why they're concerned about this. Has this happened in before? Or like, are these just, uh, you know, you know, un unbased fear is not based on anything. Uh, uh, so I, I ask that because generally like the risk is much 
lower than you think. Um, I think that if you price um, in the Eurozone by country differently, that because it's the same currency, people travel around European countries a lot. So it's very possible they could see the different price points or they could talk to somebody in another country and it's a different price. Um, so I've seen that before. Um, but also like when you're price testing for new users, um, you know, you're not changing the price points for all your existing users, unless you have a huge existing user base. Um, and that's the case when changing the price points for existing users can get you more money. Usually it's just for new users coming in where you're doing AB testing. Um, and so how, how are they going to know? Um, I think also like, do, do you see a lot of your users talking to each other? Um, like, usually not. Um, there's a few, if you have a very community based product, if you have like active forums or, or some other kind of like social community aspect where, where people are, are very involved there. Yes, maybe that, that can happen. Um, but like generally it's pretty overblown. I think that if you, you probably, um, you can probably tell them all this, that, that brand all this and they'll go, yeah, we're still concerned though. Um, so, so usually the way is you start small, um, you know, you can start with AB testing price on, uh, or changing price on a country that, that is less impactful or there's lower risk. And then you can go see, like, no one said anything. Um, I, I would bet 99% of the time, you know, no one does notice, no one does say anything. Um, Generally, it's just like it's a it's a much the concern is much more overblown than 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 reality. Yeah, one one interesting anecdote there. I interviewed um, uh, someone from Microsoft on the podcast, and we actually did a, a two part series live. And one of the things he shared is that at Microsoft scale, um, they also have to watch out for um, arbitrage. That you know if 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 Office 365 is dramatically cheaper in Azerbaijan, people will use a VPN, <laughs> go sign up, like figure out a way to pay locally, you know, get their whole thousand employees on the like dollar a month plan instead of the $15 a, a month plan in the US. Uh, but a, as Jacob was saying, I think it, it if you're not at that kind of global scale, if you're not a Strava, if you're not a Duolingo, uh, if you don't have like a, a massive community, it, it is probably, you'd probably be surprised how few people even know or pay attention. And then the other thing, well, and, uh, you know, sales are another thing. I think if people have a certain expectation of, of, you know, things going on sale. So you can also kind of frame it. I mean, that would, that would, if you frame it as a sale, that's going to skew your results. Uh, but if people are complaining, you can just say, well, we run sales and, you know, try different things. And I think people understand yeah. that people understand that at black Friday, they're going to see a different price. And so there, there is that aspect of it. It's like, you just say, Hey, we're, we're, we're trying different prices and say, just, you know, just like black Friday, you know, prices change sometimes. And sometimes you get a better deal and sometimes you get a worse deal. Like, you know, we're, we're trying to figure things out or, or whatever. And I, I think you can, um, you can manage some of that PR, uh, just by communicating well. Yeah. And just tell, tell your customer support team, if anyone reaches out, just give them a lower price, just give them a discount. Usually it's, you get a couple people reaching out to support nothing publicly, and then you just give them the lower price and you're fine. Yeah. All right, next question. In order to A-B test pricing on iOS, how is it done? Do I create a separate subscription in the same group, uh, say monthly at $19.99, monthly at $39.99? But if I do that, the user can go to their device settings and see all plans. What what, what are your latest thoughts on this? I mean, we, we've written blog posts on this and talked about it for years. Do you have any kind of like latest and greatest tips, Jacob, on like structuring these tests and subscription groups? And I mean, it's a, a very complex thing to dive into. Yeah. Um, I, I think generally honestly i refer back to revenue cats blog post on how to manage subscription groups and it's like it's so complicated like i often forget all the nuances of of like how to manage those things 
Um, I think that, um, yeah, do I create a separate subscription in the same group? Um, well, usually, yeah, right? Because you're, um, and then I think that, but you're not, um, uh, it, it gets complicated and, and sorry, I don't have perfect advice here. I, I think it really depends on your subscription group setup, how you have different things already managed. Um, I, I think you're gonna like in Revenue Cat, you're creating a new um, offering and adding those SKUs to that offering uh, and then testing those two offerings first each other. Um, and so like, Unfortunately, I, yeah, I, I don't have a perfect answer here. I, I think a lot of it depends on exactly like what your your setup is in the app, and you you kind of just uh, um, I, I think you all have revenue kind of has great great kind of guidance here that that is probably yeah. can do more justice than that. <laughs> yeah, one 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 thing to um, to note on subscription groups is that um, th a lot of folks have gotten in trouble with subscription groups and, and Apple for a long time. This is one of the things they discourage as well. Uh, they discourage creating multiple subscription groups for price testing because uh, it's easy to get in a situation where people end up with multiple subscriptions because subscription groups were actually originally designed not for price testing. And again, I hope Apple just solves all this and Google solves all this for us. But originally subscription groups were created so that you could offer um, multiple subscriptions to a single user. And so that's that's how they work now is that if you have a subscriber on one subscription group and for some reason they're able to see a paywall or go into settings or somewhere you forgot that it existed and they're like, oh, I'm not subscribed. And then they subscribe on the second subscription group. Um, now they have two subscriptions to the same product which again, it, they're supposed to be different products per subscription group so that you can have multiple subscriptions. But um, yeah, I, again, we have a lot of documentation on the Revenue Cap blog about this. And we probably we probably should do, I know uh, Peter, um, uh, my colleague at Revenue Cat is listening. We really should do like an ultimate guide to um, subscription price testing. I think we, we have various forms of that on the blog, but we really need to probably pull it all together into a single, like here, here's step-by-step-by-step, by step by step, mm -hmm. like, and here's why you don't want to create multiple subscription groups. Here's when you do. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We'll, we'll try and, and mm -hmm. get some work done on that um, uh, in the not too distant future, but it, it's a mess, Kathy. <laughs> Sorry. <And> one, <laughs> I wish we had thing, better answers for you. One thing you, you shouldn't worry about people going to the device settings and seeing all plans um if someone is that motivated great they're going to purchase a subscription from you you're trying to get someone to buy something if they want to go get a lower price great they they still bought something they still subscribed uh and so if someone is that motivated that's fine uh and, and so this is you, you can see a lot of tops apps they go to see all plans that's an absolute mess of different options there uh and so this is a common issue when you're testing different subscription prices um you know, you try to go and clean them up every once in a while, but don't worry that there's not going to be that many people that's going to go, go and do that. Yeah. All right. Um, next question. I, I like this one. What are your thoughts on offering different prices or promotions based on the states in the U.S.? And then this would maybe then apply also more broadly, different uh, regions in India, different regions in China. Yeah. What are your thoughts on um, hyper localized pricing. I've never seen it done with digital products. Um, you know, with physical goods, um, those that happens, right? Like in one grocery store in one state, I'm thinking the price of eggs are going to be different, whatever. Uh, um, I have never seen this done. I don't know of an easy way to do it. Um, because, um, like you're going to get like asked for location permissions because IP address is not super accurate on a state level. Um, you know, if you're on a, close to a border, it's not going to be accurate. If you move in your house, is it going to change? I think it's probably too complicated 
uh, to really focus on. I also, um, I don't know if there's like, or, or I don't, I don't think there's probably price discrimination laws at that level, but like, there's also going to be like, are you going to keep track of all the different like taxes? And it's, I think if you're offering different things on a state by state level, you might need to do that. I, I'm not, I'm not the expert on that. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that generally you're going to find more value offering different prices or promotions based on, um, subscription status or user type than, than that level. Like that's going to get you much more value, uh, for going, Hey, this is a free user. They're active. Let's give them a discount or this person just signed up and didn't convert. Let's give them a discount or, um, you, you know, things like that. Generally, behavior, actual product behavior, people have much more in common with than, um, uh, um, you know, like the demographic data. So, so generally, that that's better. Um, so, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen this, David? Uh, no, I haven't. And then I, I was going to follow up on on some of what you were saying is that there. There are price discrimination laws, so you do have to be careful. I don't. I don't think it would be on a state by state no, basis. But was it was it Tinder classes. that had a lawsuit for like charging more to men versus women? And yeah, Bumble, I think. Bumble. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah. So basically, there's protected classes in the U.S. and there's a different name for it in the EU: um, race, religion, yeah. gender, um, uh, and like three or four others, uh, age. Um, yeah. and uh, if you get too hyper local, you may, it may be misconstrued as, you know, like if in Spain, one region is more whatever, it's like, you, you probably do have to be a little careful, not getting too specific with any kind of hyper localization of pricing, because you, you don't want to in any way make it seem as though you're, you're, you're targeting a, a protected class. And then, you know, again, you probably want to look at the laws around price discrimination before you go too deep into even this kind of hyper localization of pricing, because yeah. uh, some countries may even ban that. So I think um, the bang for your buck will be so low, it's not worth it. That's true too. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's actually probably the best point. <laughs> Question answered. The bang for your buck is probably low enough that it's not worth it. Um, all right, I'm gonna answer this one. What are your thoughts on setting a price by benchmarking the price set by similar apps in the markets you're interested in? And so you already covered that. And then have you come across uh ASO app tools that give info on prices in different countries? Um, Jacob has a great price index blog post and tools and spreadsheets and stuff like that. So go check out Jacob's work on that. Um, next question <clears throat> in your suggestion, how would you set a price by country for a subscription business model, considering there are many communities that they are aware of any change that they could use VPN to change the country? to the cheapest country. I mean, we kind of already covered this. Any other kind of top, top thoughts? Like, you know, don't worry too much about people trying to go find the cheapest price. They're still going to be customers. They're motivated to go buy yeah. your product. Yeah. Great. Um, the percentage of people doing that is very low. You're again, you're not Microsoft. Uh, uh, yeah. so <laughs> you don't have to worry about that yet. Maybe someday, but, but unlikely. Uh, yeah. and, and so, yeah, I, I think, I think we, we covered that. Yeah, and that, that's one, one interesting thing too, uh, depending on your margins, like if you have high margins, which most apps would have high gross margin or high, yeah, gross margins on, on your subscriptions is that if people are looking for a deal, you, you might actually find ways to just let them find a deal. Like when, when I'm on a checkout page and I see, you know, a coupon code field, I will almost every single time go search for a coupon code. And guess what? It makes me feel better about purchasing that product if I get, even if I got 5% off. So if, if, so worry, if your margins are high, worry less about people looking for deals, you know, dramatically uh, um, uh, shifting your revenue because it's unlikely that any large percentage of users are going to do that. And then if they do, a couple of things. One, they may not have been a user at your normal price anyway. So it's kind of helping with your 
uh, you know, meeting people where they're at on the demand curve. Like maybe you would have offered a Black Friday sale anyway, so let them go find that cheaper price. But then secondly, um, I was on a um, Headspace uh, $5 a month plan and I was not, I did not actively use Headspace for a whole year. And I held on to that $5 a month plan because I knew that I would never get back that $5 a month plan. And so people who are on a subscription that they know they're getting a special deal, you might actually see increased retention on that. So I, I would, like Jacob said, you know, at Microsoft scale, price arbitrage and, you know, a, a company with thousands of employees or, or whatever, it's like that can be meaningful, that can create meaningful shifts in revenue. Uh, for most apps, it's not. And, and you might actually even like l leave a little breadcrumb to let people who want to pay cheaper and are super price conscious to be able to find a cheaper price and, and win them as a customer and then make them feel, I feel good when I'm getting a deal. Right. And so like you can find ways to do that. So I actually just did a, um, a promotion with uh, John Gruber on Daring Fireball, where we did 50% um, uh, off for the first year for my weather app. And I could disable that link to where it no longer functions because the promotion is over. But guess what? I'm going to leave that up because if people find that and they want it $20 for the first year and then it renews at my normal price of $40 a year, more power to them. Like that, that's one way to just let people who want a deal find a deal. Um, and so I think that's, that's an example of like, it, it's just not something to worry about. In fact, it may even be something to encourage. And if, if you have <laughs> communities where people are sharing those deals, that's amazing, right? Take advantage of those communities. Don't don't think of them as negative. All right, we are already twenty minutes over. Um, let, let's do one more question if you're okay. up for it, Jacob. One more. All right. Um, let me let me make sure we get the most. Uh, yeah, I think this is a good one. Uh, a, a little off topic again, but I think r related to pricing. Thoughts on increasing price for current subscribers. Naturally, raising the price from 40 to 60 does a lot to the revenue. Assume good to great retention rates at 40. Yeah, this one's tough. Um, I would start with new users. You may have already done that. This might, might be why you're asking. Um, I would ideally, if you're going to raise the price, provide more value. Um, don't just raise the price, figure out what you can do to give them more. That's how you stand the best chance of keeping the most people. Um, do some modeling to understand um, what level of churn you can accept. Uh, uh, and, and then think, is this reasonable? Also, is every, are, is every single user on one subscription plan or one subscription, one, one product? Probably not if you're thinking about this maybe. So is there one SKU you can raise the price to test the waters to see what actually happens for real? Uh, also, like, I think um, there's there's a lot of great content out there about how to uh, do a price change. Essentially, you want to really over communicate to your users if you're raising the price. Explain, 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 tell them the dates, tell them when it's going to happen, make sure they're not surprised. Make sure every person that's getting their price raised it, will know about it if they've ever read email in the last three months. <laughs> uh, uh, and then tell them what's happening and you're adding more value. Uh, and, and, and yes, figure out if you can test the waters on a small scale uh, um, first. And if you haven't tried raising the price for just new users, figure out. Um, you can also estimate conversion rates. If you raise the price for 40 to 60 to new users, if you haven't already done that, and conversion rates drop off, well, maybe your product isn't quite as valuable as you thought it was. Uh, and maybe you need to add more value or position or package the value a little differently. Uh, um, so hopefully that that's helpful uh, in how to think about that. And then one thing you definitely wanna keep an eye on is on iOS, uh, Apple has very specific rules that if your price change is over, what is it, over $5 or over some percentage, yeah. I should know this off the top of my head, I'm, I'm embarrassed to not know it, uh, but Apple has certain rules where if you raise the price by a certain amount, um, you will, they the subscriptions will auto cancel instead of auto renew. So let's say, and I should, I should know this, but let's say that 
the raise from 40 to 60 would require people to confirm the price increase. One way to, to do this is to actually increase it $5 this year, $5 next year, $5 a year after, $5 a year after. Um, and in that case, they will continue renewing and you can slowly bump them up to what you feel the optimal price is without triggering that auto cancellation. Um, so whatever the rules are, I think Jacob's looking it up. I don't know if you found it already, <laughs> but whatever the rules are, um, uh, stay, try to stay under it and then ratchet up the price gradually so that you don't auto have, have a bunch of people auto canceling. That said, I actually just recently did this. I had people when I first launched my weather app in 2014, I priced it at 50 cents a month. <laughs> <laughs> huge regret in 2024. And I kept grandfathering those folks in. And then finally, this time when I raised it from four to $5, I went in and just did not grandfather anyone in. So anybody who was on that $4 price is not, is going to auto opt in to the $5 price. And those at 50 cents, um, you know, I, I didn't follow best practices. I didn't communicate, but there, it was a small enough cohort that when I looked at that cohort and how much I was actually making off of them, um, raising that price, if every single person canceled at the 50 cent price, I'd be fine. And and for me, it was actually just like a cleaning up that like embarrassing <laughs> moment years ago. You know, generally the advice is like, be generous with those people who've been with you for, you know, seven years but like my app has generated a ton of value and like we pay a ton we've added a bunch of uh we've added widgets which are really expensive because they they consume a lot of data like we've added so much value in those seven years that it's really pretty unreasonable for those folks to still be paying 50 cents a month um so that's what i did um the, probably not the perfect best practices but sometimes sometimes you just you know make a big cut and you weigh the downsides and it, it's going to be fine um, so yeah, hope, hope that was helpful. Um, but with that, let's wrap up. It has been a ton of fun talking, Jacob. Thanks for staying late to answer questions. Um, you can check out, um, retention.blog. That's where Jacob shares a ton of his stuff. As I mentioned, he's done the, uh, has tools and spreadsheets around, uh, pricing that are super helpful. Anything else you wanted to share, Jacob, as we end this? Um, follow me on LinkedIn too. I, I post stuff there too, and then share good insights. Uh, um, but yeah, go, go subscribe to retention.blog. If you thought anything here was, was valuable, uh, uh, and there's more, more great stuff there. Uh, so yeah, thank you all. I re really appreciate uh, you having me on David.